I like to ask questions that I think are deep and difficult and beautiful. The aesthetic sense of what makes a, uh, a question elegant and beautiful matters a lot to me. And then I try to pick problems where I can make progress. You know, some problems are beautiful but are sort of impossibly out there. So I do feel that the way you build, you know, great edifices is by putting bricks in place. The thing is, uh, very often, you can actually do that for things that you would think would be impossibly difficult. So it's a matter of just being creative and bringing to bear tools that you've learned from different fields, you know, putting them together in a, in a different way. I'm a theorist and I work in sort of broadly across multiple areas of physics, theoretical neuroscience and computer science. So, you know, in my daily work, I move smoothly between all these fields. I'm doing them all at the same time. My PhD and my training was in you know, the fundamental laws of nature, the nature of space and time, uh, gravity near black holes and the early universe, and how you quantize the theory of gravity. So that's a, a core component of what I do, is thinking about you know, basically the foundations of physics and the fundamentals of what space and time are. So I've clearly been interested throughout my career in the nature of information, what it is, and how it appears and is processed by systems in the natural world. I've been interested in questions on the one hand like uh, uh, black holes and do they destroy information, basically Hawking's famous paradox, you know, how is that possible? On the other hand, I've been interested in questions like uh, how can neural systems take information from the world, encode it and then transmit it to the central brain? There's another clearly a chain that's been running through my work which, uh, uh, which has to do with the notion of complexity. I've written a whole series of papers at various points about how some kinds of physical dynamics produce complex states of matter and others don't. Basically going after the question about how physical and biological processes can produce complexity from states that weren't complex to start with. So overall, uh, you know, I'm interested in the laws and principles that govern the organization of systems in nature, whether they be living or non-living, and so I, I sort of tend to span a rather enormous range of scales, I guess. While there is a lot of talk of interdisciplinarity in academia, in practice, in fact, it's, a, it's somewhat more rigid than that because basically you get a degree in a field, you're rewarded for performance in a field by the standards of that field. So navigating this sort of doing multiple things, um, uh, you know, that, that kind of career uh, requires some care in the sense that you have to establish uh, street cred in the discipline separately. The people in each field to accept that you're worthy of the standard of being an expert in that field. Maybe knowledge doesn't have to be cut that way. When I was like seven, I think, we were living in Calcutta in India. We used to go to the market and they had these uh, booksellers. I saw a How and Why Wonder Book on Lives of Famous Scientists. I remember thinking, wow, you can do this? It just seemed amazing, right? I mean, these people just sat around and figured out what the world was like. Physics as a discipline, I used to see it anyway as the most fundamental, right? It's the, it's the basic laws from which everything else is built. So it was clear I'd be a physicist. But I think as I began to go through high school and learn to program machines and stuff like that, it occurred to me that, you know, if computers that I could program were constrained in what they could do by the nature of the circuits they have, then surely I am too. So I began to feel that there was a problem with my understanding of the laws of nature and that I clearly needed to understand how we're able to think the thoughts that we're able to think. I was a junior fellow of something called the Harvard Society of Fellows, which is not affiliated to any particular lab. You can do whatever you want. So I used that freedom to sort of moonlight in neuroscience labs and basically learn the subject. And by that time, you know, I had amassed a, a, a different toolkit, I would say, than most people. I knew lots of things in theoretical physics. I knew lots of math. I knew tons of computer science. One of my first papers as a graduate student occurred because I had just learned general relativity and uh, therefore knew how to work, uh, describe the mathematics of differential geometry and curved spaces. And at the same time, I had been thinking about the question of Occam's razor. Is there a mathematical reason why a simple explanation in some sense is actually a better description of a phenomenon? And I started thinking about the geometry of the space of mathematical models as explanations using the tools I had just learned by studying general relativity. And that was my first paper as a graduate student and you know it's very well cited and all that kind of stuff. And I really enjoyed that because it was just putting together pieces that people hadn't really put together before and kind of assembling these all into a, a story. 
I have many tools in the toolkit. So with my students and postdocs, we've been basically deploying those tools. When we were thinking about the circuits in your brain, there's something called the grid cell system that make the maps that you have of the world. We realized that the self-organizing dynamics of this neural circuit is an analogy of classic self-organizing problems in condensed matter physics. In particular, something called the frankel kontorova model that we were able to take and say, oh great, and what we need is a two-dimensional generalization of this thing. So once we realized that, we were able to guess how to organize a system of neurons to have a dynamics to produce these kinds of hierarchical maps of the world. So the idea came directly from knowing some problems in condensed matter physics. For me, literature matters a great deal. You know, I spent much of my childhood summers you know, reading books. My imagination was basically formed by reading these stories. The liberal arts really are getting short shrift in our world today. I think it's extremely dangerous because I don't think uh, science and technology teach us how to live. I think the liberal arts teach us how to live. The dangers of becoming unmoored from our cultures and our histories and our pasts are on ample display around the world. If there isn't a healthy society to support science, science will die. Even the history of science and sociology of science matters. We often have this heroic narrative of, you know, the world was in darkness and then great person X came along and had this sort of deep insight and then all of a sudden all was good and we knew something. That's not the way science works. There's this sea of developments that made that possible and that matters. In my own teaching what I do is I try to use literary examples and uh, analogies. Every week, in addition to the sort of science stuff, we would keep aside half of one class to uh, read something from literature, and something to contextualize. So this is in the first chapter of Swan's Way, the first book of The Remembrance of Things Past by Marcel Proust. So he says, For many years already, everything about Cambrai had ceased to exist for me, when one day in winter as I returned home, my mother, seeing that I was cold, suggested that I have a little tea. She sent for one of those squat plump cakes called Petite Madeleine that look as though they have been molded in the grooved valve of a scallop shell. But at that very instant, when the mouthful of tea mixed with cake crumbs touched my palate, I quivered. Suddenly, the memory appeared. That taste was the taste of the little piece of Madeleine, which on Sunday mornings at Cambrai, my Aunt Leonie would give me after dipping in her infusion of tea or lime blossom. I think it's just a remarkable uh, document about the power of taste and smell to evoke memories. Science is great, but uh, you know, every time you walk around, it's good to know what's around you, and what made the world, and what makes the world and sustains the world is the uh, culture and society of the people around you. So.